Theravada Buddhism series Dharma talk number five. Today's title is Consciousness and its Associate. At one time, one of the yogi asks a question, what is consciousness? And I answered in a one-line answer. Today, I will take this as an opportunity to give thee a fuller, rounded answer of what consciousness is. In Pali, it's called Chaita. Vijnana, Mano. These are all Pali words and it is translated into English as consciousness. But it is not a sufficient, that word consciousness is not sufficient to cover the full meaning of jaita. But that was is the only one available in English to explain what Cheta is. Consciousness is an ability or a phenomenon of awareness of physical or mental object. Consciousness is an ability or a phenomenon of awareness of a physical or mental object. That's what consciousness is, one line answer. That awareness, this particular awareness, is bare awareness. Simply having a sense of the existence of an object. Just sensing there's an object, there's something. That's it that degree, that level of awareness. Let's call it bare awareness. It is not like awareness when we meditate. That awareness in meditation is called mindfulness, mindful awareness. Or even reach the level of the awareness of attention. When you give attention, there's a, a certain degree of awareness. Not that kind of awareness either, even lesser quality. It's simply a bare awareness, simply no there is an object. To understand that, I like to explain this way. We all know motion detector. Motion detector fully operating. Whenever there is a motion, it detects it and confirms it by 
beeping. Beep, 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 beep. That's a motion. It doesn't know that's a cat or a dog or a child or anything. Simply a motion. Other than that knows nothing. Just like that, consciousness knows there's an object. That's it. That is consciousness. That is jikta or vinyana or mano. So, when we say consciousness, an object or a thing comes along with it, because it is the awareness of the object consciousness is. So, without the object, there is no awareness. So, that means when we say consciousness, there is an object. It comes automatically with it. Consciousness cannot arise without an object. It depends on the object to arise. So, to have an object, let's call it our own little definition. This is the first law of consciousness. Not in the scripture. We are making it up. Consciousness depends on the object to arise. The first law of consciousness for our own purpose of understanding. Another requirement for consciousness To arise is mental factors. In Pali, Kochi, the Sika. English, mental factors. That's another requirement. Which means consciousness cannot arise without the mental factors. Mental factors cannot be there without consciousness. Consciousness alone by itself cannot understand or paint an object, so to speak. Cannot understand the object. You can't paint and explain what the object is. And this understanding of the object is the job. Or the function of mental factors. So they have their own job. Consciousness is simply to know the existence of a sense, the existence of an object, and mental factor is to understand the object, to paint the object, to describe the object. There are 52 kinds of mental factors. Consciousness is like a colorless water, pure colorless. And mental factors like a uh, like coloring powder. If you put red, it becomes a red water. If you put green, it becomes green water, blue water, and so on. They color so that we can describe it, understand it, before it was colorless. So these mental factors are the tools for the consciousness to reach an object. Consciousness by itself cannot reach the object. It needs the tools 
or the mental factors to reach and to paint and to describe and understand the object. That is mental factors, Jetasika. Okay, so to understand these things, I like to use an analogy. Let's use computer. A human being, a person, is like a functioning computer, fully operating computer. In a functioning computer, there's electricity running. Electricity is like a consciousness. hardware and basic operating program. It's just like a physical body and the sensitivities. Eye sensitivity, ear sensitivity and so on. That is like a, the hardware of a computer and the its basic operating system. When there's an electricity plug-in, little cursor is bouncing up and down. And the software that you put in are like mental factors, Jadisika. And the directives sent to the keyboard via the keyboard to the computer is like a external object. Okay, we want to use Word or Excel or this or that. All these software you must have it. Those are the sensitivities and the outside objects are like somebody pressing the keyboard, sending command, sending command, sending object, sending object. So all these collectively, okay, electricity, hardware of the computer, software and the keyboard is the complete functioning computer. In the same way, consciousness, your physical body and sensitivities, and the external object. are collectively called as human being. That's a all-rounded way of describing what human being is. So consciousness and mental factors, they arise together and also they disappear together. And they both take the same object. If the consciousness sends the rose, the manufacturers also take the rose as an object. They both take the same object. And also they have the same basis to arise. If the consciousness arises through the eye, which means eye consciousness, okay. the mental factors also use the eye base. 
the same thing, no space, ear base, tongue base, body base, mind base. They use the same base. to arise. And this requirement between consciousness and Jitasika mental factors, let's call it is the second law of consciousness. These are not in the scripture. I just try to put what is necessary. The first one, the first requirement dependent is object, first law. The second one is mental factors, Jitasika, second law. We know that there are 52 mental factors, Buddha enumerated and taught us, there are 52 of them. Out of the 52, Seven matter, seven mental factors always arises with every type of consciousness. There are 121 types of consciousness, and whenever any one of these 121 arises, these seven mental factors arises instantly together with them. Now we are talking about mental factors, or you can call it the associates of the consciousness, mental associate, mental factors. Thirteen mental factors, which also include the aforementioned seven mental factors. They are immoral. Okay. These can be a uh, wholesome. These can be unwholesome. These can be resultant. These can be functional. So whichever type of consciousness they associate with, they become it. But if they are without wholesome consciousness or unwholesome consciousness, or resultant consciousness or functional consciousness, they are immoral. They are neutral. So these 13 types of Consciousness are called variables. They can be either one. Now they will call it LGBTQ or something like that. Variables. Another group of 14 mental factors belong to the unwholesome nature. In other words, there are 14 mental factors of unwholesome nature and the remaining 25 belongs to the wholesome or beautiful nature. So there are three groups. First group is immoral or variables, 13 of them. Second group is unwholesome or immoral, 14 of them. And the last one is wholesome or beautiful, 25 of them. Altogether, 52. So depending on which mental factors arises, a certain type of consciousness arises. So let's go back to the, the original seven. The seven 
immoral or variable mental factors that arise together with every type of consciousness are called universal mental factors because they are universal you they are common to every consciousness so their name is called universal mental factors these are mental these mental factors their names are one mental contact pasa two feeling vedana three perception sanya four volition chetana five ekagata one pointedness six life faculty jiwiting dariya and seven attention manasikara so i'll stay straight out in english these seven are mental contact feeling volition one point in nice perception life faculty and attention and these seven are essential mental factors in cognitive process okay because we cognize things we cognize objects we cognize situation condition whenever we are cognizing a thing or an object these seven mental factors are functioning without them you can't cognize so they are very important to the cognitive process that's why we are going to touch one by one the first one in pali is pasa translated as mental contact when an external object strike one of the six sensitivities and the corresponding consciousness come together when those three comes together okay pasa mental contact arises that's how pasa arises those three have to come together at that moment before that bare at consciousness or pure consciousness which only sense an object that bare or pure consciousness is so to speak replaced by the sense consciousness to give you an example a form of an object a rose strike the eye sensitivity and the eye consciousness arises so when those three come together at that moment pasa mental contact arises that is what pasa is mental contact is second one is called vedana vedana in english is feeling okay according to the dependent origination due to mental contact feeling arises whenever those three elements come together pasa is formed when there is a pasa 
there's a feeling. Feeling arises due to mental contact. Because of mental contact, feeling arises. That means pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral feelings arises due to the coming together of the three elements, mental contact. When you said that way, it sounds like mental contact and feeling are appearing, appearing sequentially, chronologically. But the true fact is they both arise together at the same time. However, in this particular case, mental contact is the leader and feeling is the follower. So that's a second universal mental factor, Vedana. The third one is called Sanya. It's translated into English as perception. So this perception, at the same time when the mental contact and feeling are operating, at the same time, there's another fan- mental factor called perception, sanya. It's also doing its job. Everybody is doing their own job. They are each department. Simultaneously at the same time, they are doing their stuff at their own department. What this perception does was, it is recording and remembering based on the marks of the object based on the sign of the object and the way in whichever way it perceived. If there are 10 people looking at the same object, they might be perceived similarly or differently or exactly the same. They are variables. that sanya may be perceiving exactly as the object is, as it is, or it may be perceiving wrongly. To give you an example how one can perceive wrongly is, a bird had an encounter with a man, the man shoo it off, throw a stone, fly away, scared, the next time, he's hungry, he come back to the firm, the firm. And then the bird saw the scarecrow. And the bird thought scarecrow is a man. So, didn't approach the field and flew away. The bird perceived the scarecrow as a human being. That's a wrong perception. So regardless, when the same object arises again to that person, when the same object appears again, sanya, sanya, perception, would still recognize according to the way, according to the mark it was recorded at the first time. If it is rightly recorded, you will remember the object. But even if it is wrongly recorded, it would still recognize the object. 
That is sanya, perception. The third mental, universal mental factor. And the fourth one is in Pali called chitana. In English, volition. Buddha said, karma is chitana. Chitana is karma. We all know what karma is. So chitana and karma are synonymous. Of course, if you split in details quite deeply, you will see a few variations. But at this stage, this is good enough. Chitana is karma, karma is chitana. This chitana determines the ethical aspect of a condition with an object. And its job is to force, to force associated mental factors. When chitana is arising, there are many other mental factors arising as well, as a group. But this mental factor chitana fools the all other associated mental factors engage with the object. In other words, it pushed them to engage with the object. That's what chitana does. And this chitana or karma is also called as sankara, independent origination. The same thing, it's karma, chitana, but there it used the word sankara, independent origination. So that is the, the fourth. Universal mental factor, chitana, volition. The fifth one is ikagata, translated as one pointedness. Here, ika means one, ega means object. If you combine the two, become ikagata, one with the object. This ikagata makes one with the object. In other words, it is concentration, samadhi. When you are practicing samadhi meditation, what are you doing? You are trying to become one with the object. So samadhi, concentration, ikagata. They are all one and the same in terms of meaning. And its job, the function, job, I use the word job, but proper word is called function. Its job is to unite the associated mental factors. What you say, mental factor does not arise alone. When we are talking about one, there are a whole bunch of them that its associates are there. And this ikagada, one-pointedness job, is to unite them together. There is one-pointedness in every interface with an object. Anybody who sees an object, who engages with an object, who touches an object, there's that one-pointedness. Penetrative, penetrate into the object. But, of course, 
depending on the condition, depending on the person, that degree or intensity of one-pointedness varies. That is one-pointedness, another universal mental factor, number five. So number six is Jiwi Dendriya, translated as life faculty. There are two types of life faculty, physical and mental. But in here, it is referring to the mental life faculty. And this life faculty maintains the lifespan of the associated mental factors. It always comes back to the a group of friends, associates, that arise together, that come together, that walk together. So this life faculty maintain the lifespan of the associated mental factors. It makes sure they don't disappear before their lifespan. Every object has a lifespan. They call it Uti Bin. Arising, existing, and disappearing, three phase. That is their lifespan. And before the end of the lifespan, this life faculty makes sure they don't go disarray or disappear. That's his job. But be mindful, be careful. This life faculty does not cause these associated mental factors to arise. It is not the cause. It is simply the maintenance person, it maintain, they are existent so that they have a full and complete existence. That it is, that is its job. That's a sixth universal mental factor. And the last one is called Manasikara, translated as attention. This Manasikara's job is to turn the associated mental factors towards the object. In other words, you and a group of friends were there and suddenly there was an eagle flying, you saw it and you just pointed, hey, there's an eagle, pointed the finger and all your friends turned in that direction. That's called drawing attention. That's attention. That is the job of attention. In here, attention of the other mental factors which are arising with it. Without attention, mind wanders aimlessly. The wandering mind the drifting mind, that's, there's no attention. And it is a vital mental factor. It's a vital to, to cognize an object. If you don't have attention, you won't cognize the object. Only when you have attention on it, you will cognize the object. It's a vital factor, vital too. Just to understand it, nowadays we know people with ADD, attention deficit disorder. They cannot concentrate on anything. Their mind is always dispersing, drifting. That means they cannot put any attention onto an object. So those is the seven universal mental factors. So this will give you a, a fairly rounded understanding of what consciousness is. 
Consciousness cannot arise alone. When consciousness arises, there's an object. When consciousness arises, there's the mental factors. Seven of the 52 always arises with every types of consciousness. And their qualities are explained here. And they are vital for cognitive process. So by understanding what consciousness is and what its mental associates are, may you be able to understand theoretically what your experiential experience and meditation are and bridge the gap. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you very much.